It's time to take a ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive with our co-hosts, Alan Saunders and Zachary Smith. Welcome back to another episode of Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm Zachary Smith. That is Alan Saunders. Alan, uh, it's a victory Monday, but it's another one of those ones that because of uh, you know, just the way Steelers fans are with the turnover that we've had on offense, not yet the uh, the results showing yet uh, there. It almost feels like it's a half misery Monday baked in. I'm not sure it's Monday, to be perfectly honest. So uh, I'll just <laughs> yeah, take you, your you've word. You've had a lot going on. Yeah, you've had a lot going on. I don't know. Hours. Um, man, I I am not the process over results guy. I'm sorry, the results of a process guy. Yeah. But do not ignore two road wins given the circumstances for this team and how meaningful they are. Um, like, I, I don't know. I think here's why I think the, here's where I think the, the feelings are coming from is that uh, we talked a lot on the show this summer about how these Steelers were much improved at nearly every position across the board, and mm-hmm. yet were still not reasonable Super Bowl contenders. They just were not because of questions about Arthur Smith, questions about the quarterback position, and the youth on the offensive line primarily, uh, and a very mm-hmm. difficult schedule. And I think uh, those things have become real for some people who were choosing not to believe they were real. And like was in a conversation on Twitter with someone. I don't remember because I was in the middle of flying home who it was or what the conversation was, but I was like, like if you unless you were thinking this is a Super Bowl team, this is a pretty good result. So like th- this I, I feel like that's where we are, where it's like to me personally, I picked this team to go nine and eight. I think they're ahead of my expectations right now. I thought that I did not think they would be two and zero right now, and mm-hmm. I did think the offense was going to look basically how it has looked. Maybe a little bit worse, to be honest. Especially if you had told me that Isaac Samalo wasn't going to play, Russell Wilson wasn't going to play, Broder Jones was going to be their worst offensive lineman when he did play. I don't think I would have told you the Steelers were going two and zero to start this season. Yeah, well, that's that's very fair, and you know, I, I think that that's all necessary context to where they're at now. I told you the same uh, when we were doing the live show uh, post game last night, and you mentioned was it James Daniels? I believe yeah. you said was the yeah. player that was talking about like, hey, listen, we're two and zero, oh, both road games. You know, like necessary context, uh, backup quarterback. Like this is all necessary context to take in here. Uh, while also I think it's fair to have your concerns about the offense, it's fair to have concerns coming into the season. I don't think they've necessarily answered them yet, but it's not like, you know, it shouldn't be all doom and gloom being two and oh, just because they haven't found that that success as of yet. Yeah. I mean, I think it was unreasonable to think this offense was going to hit the ground running and be some kind of juggernaut. I do think they have a lot of the pieces that they can build around. Like when you have a young offensive line, they're not good in week one and week two, but they might be good by the end of the season. Um, I don't know. Here's the other thing I want to add to that, Alan, is because I understand we're going to actually have a question about Arthur Smith in the second game and just the offense in totality in the second game that we can draw from. But, you know, you mentioned the process over the results there, and I 100% agree because I think that that would show more sustainability in what they're doing. But to that point... I thought the process for the most part was there in week one, you know, fourth and time of possession only had one three and out. I think a lot of good things were done in that game. That was where the process to me was ahead of the results. Now, obviously in game two, we can talk about that more and that might not have been the case, but if you're somebody that is looking for process over results right now, I would think that you were pretty okay with the way week one turned out. How about the first six quarters? Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, actually, the eight quarters they played this year. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I understand a lot of the concerns that people have. Don't get me wrong. I share a lot of the concerns that people have about this offense, but it's not anything that's been done on the field yet that's necessarily changed that for better or for worse. Like, this is what I expected largely, uh, to your point. 
Um, something I wanted to ask you about before we get too far into this was something that I had like a couple people send me. You said somebody sent you this as well, and I thought it would made for an interesting conversation piece on here. Former Steelers defensive lineman Chris Hoke was talking about actually a couple things. We'll bring up the Broderick Jones thing first because uh, I want to get your opinion on this. As somebody that was around, obviously, Broderick Jones the entirety of the spring, summer, all, all the process so far, uh, Chris Hoke, Hoke said that he looked disinterested and disengaged from the process uh, when he saw him in training camp. I, I mean, obviously, I was only there two days. I don't want to speak to this on, on that a personal level. I wanted to get your take on this, though, because I feel like this is really just lumping things on a guy that's struggling right now and taking it to a, a level that it doesn't need to be at. Yeah, I don't really understand that comment. Uh, I don't understand where it's coming from. Um, Broderick is a he's a very enthusiastic person. Like that's the part of it that I really don't understand is that like James Daniels, mm -hmm. very quiet, very unassuming head down, like never gets too high, never gets too low. Doesn't show a lot of emotion. If, if, if an observer wanted to come up to me and be like, Hey man, 78 doesn't even look like he wants to be here. I would be like, I mean, I've talked to the man. I get a pretty good sense he does, but I could see that. You know, like I, I can I can see how you yeah. would interpret the way he right. is and his body language to mean that. I don't really understand. And I'm not saying that Hokie's wrong. I'm just saying, I, to me, that's not how I would describe Broderick Jones. I think he's he's like a puppy dog. He's like very enthusiastic. <laughs> Like sometimes he's like got more enthusiasm than he has ability, which, you know, is not great either. But like, I, I, I don't, I've never seen that. And then, so I don't really understand where that's coming from. Maybe, you know, about the way he's being coached. I, I you know, I, I don't know, but like, I, I see a young man with a lot of enthusiasm for the game. For everything, to be perfectly honest, I just see a young man with a lot of enthusiasm for life. He's a happy-go-lucky guy. I have never talked to a player that got benched and was more willing to go talk to the media, engage in the process, and, like, legitimately just had a conversation. Like, do you know how hard it is to talk to a player who's just gotten benched? Like, those are the least mm -hmm. comfortable conversations I have. Like, short of, like, people dying or people having like serious outside of football life consequences about things. People get arrested. People have illnesses, whatever, like, you know, somebody has a career ending injury. Okay. Like t take all that off the top. Like you go out there and you have, you get replaced by the first round pick. You get one drive to come in to show what you can do. And you have that drive. And then you're going to come have a conversation. Like, yeah, I, I don't know. I thought he was perfectly, normal and so like to me like that really stood out to me. like you got to be pretty interested in the process to have that attitude where it's like hey man i was pretty bad today and these guys are going to come talk to me about it and i'm going to take that head on and uh and just be like normal about it like someone someone dm me like broader jones confidence has to be shot and i'm like those are not the actions of an unconfident individual if you have no confidence, you're not you're not going to meet the reporters like, come on, guys, let's let's talk. Like that that's yeah. not that's not someone who doesn't have confidence. I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of narratives out there about Broderick Jones that I just I'm not seeing from the person that I know. I think he's struggling. I think he's yeah. disappointed yeah, yeah. in his own play. I think the direct quote was like, I I'm I'm kicking my own ass. Like I, I you know, I think he's upset about the way he's playing. But I, I don't I don't see disinterested. I don't see disengaged in the process. I don't see a lack of confidence in his own abilities or his ability to be better. You know, um, Brian Batko, the post Gazette, asked a really good question, I thought, in the post game, you know, Broderick Jones is not a guy who throughout his college career necessarily faced a lot of adversity. Like, he didn't play when he was a young player, and then he was still mm -hmm. on championship teams, and then he seamlessly went right into the starting lineup and was again on championship teams. Like, there was none of this, and Broderick just kind of said, like, yeah, man, that's football. Like, that's life. You just go get it. And so... I don't. I don't know. I, I. I don't. I don't see any of this stuff that I feel like is being talked about his personality at all right now. 
you kind of answered what my follow up was going to be there because I was going to say how much of just that, by the way who he yeah you are getting good at that <laughs> I was just say how much of this uh like is who he is has person maybe just being like put on him in his approach because like you use the James Daniels example as well. And I, th I was going to go there as well. Like, is there somebody else that you can kind of look at and, and say, like, there's an example of a guy that just who he is as a person could maybe project that, even though that's not actually the way that it is. That's not the case. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think I, sometimes it is. And sometimes it isn't like, you know, like Chooks, a core for uh, walked mm -hmm. away from the new England Patriots last week. I mean, if mm -hmm. like the middle of last season, you told me like some player on the Steelers was going to like up and quit and like never come back, I'd have been like, Chooks. Like, it was just a guy that didn't necessarily look like he loved football, that he had to be there um, mm -hmm. at, at all times. I, I don't, I mean, I'm not sure that I would say that I think Broderick Jones is like some sort of like football demon where like he just has to be there. It's, it's in his veins. Like, it, he can't do anything else, but he certainly seems like he's enjoying himself out there. I, I like, he's got a smile on his face every day. I, I, I don't know. I don't. Yeah. I, I don't understand where the criticism is coming for from. And I, like I said, I don't want to say a hokey's wrong. I, I just don't. I, I don't. I'm not seeing what he's seeing. Uh, he also, you know, along with the Roger Jones thing, uh, talked about Patrick Queen, uh, said, I just don't think he's playing good football right now, having a tough time engaging offensive line and getting off those blocks, see him getting knocked back too much, getting locked up. And that's not his game. I don't know if he's comfortable yet in this defense, two tackles last week and this week, only four on the season for high price free agent coming over from Baltimore defense that played really, really well. Leaves me scratching my head was his exact quote. Yeah. I'm uh, obviously he's not playing it like a, hundred percent with that groin you missed thursday's practice um and so i guess you kind of take that into account i don't think he's been bad i just don't think he's mm -hmm. had a lot of splash which is kind of think what you were hoping for um but i think he has done a pretty nice job of kind of it's interesting somebody on the defense has to do a hard job. And I think he's done a lot of those hard jobs. And I think like he's taken some responsibilities that have let other guys make some plays. And I don't think he's necessarily like dominating those responsibilities. It's sort of like, I'm trying to think of a, of an equivalent, right? Like in hockey, right? If, if your best defenseman is going out there against Sidney Crosby, he's probably still going to look bad from time to time, but like, it's so much better than if you put your number six defenseman out there, right? Like I, I think they're giving him roles that are really difficult and that is allowing like what he did against B. John Robinson is stuff that like you, you, you can't line anybody, just anybody up there and say, go uh, where like, those are like really difficult assignments. And so even if he's not executing them at a hundred percent, the fact that you're able to give him that assignment makes the rest of the defense around him better and if you kind of yeah. just hyper focus on his play, you're like, what's he doing? But then you kind of realize that, oh, what he's doing is Deshaun Elliott's in the backfield making a tackle. But and like, yeah, like, I, I think that's that's part of it here is the Steelers have know they have a pretty good linebacker and they can put a lot on his plate. And maybe he doesn't make all the plays, but those things being on his plate helps everyone. Uh, to that point, I mean, if he's a big reason why Deshaun Elliott's playing the way that he has through two weeks, then uh, yeah, cap tip to him. To the so speaking to the splash, I know it was thrown right at him, but like, how different is his conversation if he did have a pick in this game against Bo Nix? I mean, and and very specifically, he was engaged with an offensive lineman, and got his hands free, and got his hands on that football too. Like, yeah, it was thrown yeah. right at him, but that was still a nice play. Um, it's not easy to get your arms free from an offensive lineman when you're a what is he six one linebacker? Like that's that's yeah. you know that's not not supposed to be the mo there, right? Absolutely, um, Alan. We actually have. Foot, I, I gave him an inch. Yeah, you gave we'll, him an we'll inch. It, well, we'll I'm sure he slide. appreciated that. Yeah, we'll let it, it is it is far better to be in my position to uh, to give the inch than to be short. The <laughs> inch. You get called out later for being short the inch. Yeah, well, he, so Patrick Queen is in, in fact six foot six foot two maybe even uh, <laughs> on this podcast. Uh, 
Alan, we had a few things that we wanted to touch on here from the YouTube comments. Berg, sports fan who was a regular, definitely had a couple of good things that I wanted to touch on here. First and foremost, he said, is there something that you see that you can pinpoint to the issues that Fields and Frazier are having with these quarterback center exchanges? Yeah, um, the issue is not really Fields, uh, at least on this one. It's about the operation of the uh Oh gosh, I'm I'm uh, blanking on the words here. Of the uh, silent count, the, 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 that's what the issue was. It's about being on the same page in terms of Fields is giving multiple signals to multiple people at the same time. Right, he's got a signal from motion. He's got another signal to the guard that he's ready to go, and then there also has to be a way for him to communicate changes and something in that process is breaking down. It's happened twice now where he wasn't ready for the snap. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened uh, on Sunday. And so, I mean, you got a rookie center in there. You also have a rookie. Well, I mean, second year guy playing his first football <coughs> as the one, you know, giving the signal. And so I think these are just growing pains. I I'm, I, I think the under center stuff you could probably more that happened in Atlanta and that had happened with Herbig in the preseason is more about fields. He has a long history of uh, trouble with under center snaps. You look at his fumble totals in Chicago, pretty um, elevated, but these shotgun ones, I think are more about the process of the, uh, of the silent operation than it is anything fields is doing wrong. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, personally, I don't, I, I really couldn't pinpoint exactly what's going on. But it's impossible to pinpoint like yeah. exactly what is wrong. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, I'll just say this: it's when the quarterback is not ready for the ball it, in a shotgun, and it's almost never the quarterback's fault. Have, Something else went wrong. I, I know in the preseason when there was the issue with Herbig and uh, Fields, how those conversations went about, you know, they were giving a blame, like saying it was my fault and it was my fault, all these things. Has Frazier or Fields, though, like I know that Frazier spoke, like have they talked about it at all, like said anything regarding those exchanges or what went wrong from their perspective? Uh, n not that I saw after uh, Sunday's game, but I did mm -hmm. talk to Frazier after the opener and there was those two bobbled snaps. And, mm -hmm. you know, he kind of gave the politically correct answer uh, where, like, okay. he didn't, you know, he said, I don't know. We got to work on those. Uh, I think that I think the under center stuff is mostly fields. But th this clearly was either it's either Anderson or it's Frazier. And from the mm -hmm. outside, it's almost impossible to tell who got what wrong. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we'll come back. It's possible that fields yeah. forgot the snap count. But like that is. Mm. Yeah. Right. That the quarterback being that guy is almost never happens. Uh, we'll come back to Berg Sports Fan because they actually had a second thing here, but it goes with somebody else's question, so we'll wait uh, for that one. But uh, was this the one? Yeah, uh, does anyone else get as mad as I do when we see Cordell Patterson in the backfield? You have Naj and Warren, Patterson should rarely see the field as their only RB out there. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the crux of a very valid critique of Arthur Smith. Um, and it, it goes beyond just um, Cordero Patterson. But I literally said that in the press box yesterday <laughs> that yeah. like, why is Cordero Patterson out there? Like they, they were not, they were not running Najee Harris or Jalen Warren so hard that I felt like they needed a, to get a third guy involved and I think that one of the real criticisms of Arthur Smith over the years is that he seems to try a little bit too hard to get everyone involved. And I, I think that's really the first time I've seen it here with the Steelers where I'm like, Oh, I see that. Like, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really think that Cordell Patterson, I mean, he only had four snaps. So like, whatever, but right. like I would, I would not be trying to get Cordell Patterson work. I don't think that uh, Michael Pruitt needs 28 snaps compared to 29 for Darnell Washington and 38 for Pat Frymuth. Like, I, I don't think Michael Pruitt's a bad player, 
but that feels like too many. Um, yeah. I kind of can get down with Scotty Miller and Ben Skoranek because as we talked about last week, if the other receivers aren't going to catch, you may as well put the guys out there that can block. But yeah. George Pickens only on the field 77% of the time. I don't care what else happens. He is literally their only g- good receiving option. Like, I feel like it needs to be like basically short yardage goal line where you're just lining up at a formation that says we are not going to throw the ball outside of those like one or two plays in a game. Like that that's that's 15 plays George Pickens was not on the field for. That feels like too many to me. Which is And I understand yeah. the altitude, maybe he tapped out. I don't know. I I guess I'll give Art the benefit of the doubt on that specifically, but I really doubt that both running backs tapped out. Like I I don't know. I feel like the mm-hmm. uh I feel like that's a legit critique of Arthur Smith that has yeah. gone beyond these two games that we see in Pittsburgh. That was sort of his MO uh, from his time in Atlanta. Yeah, I put out the snap counts uh, early this morning on my Twitter and had people responding. Uh, for a second straight week, Van Jefferson as the wide receiver that played the most snaps. So that kind of goes into what you were saying about, you know, Pickens needs to play more than that, obviously. Uh, ben Skronik, because you know what he can do as a blocker at the very least, if they're not going to be receiving threat anyway. I mean, there's a lot of different routes you could go with it. But, yeah, with what Van's given them, I you know, playing 81% of the snaps. I don't actually hate, like, Van's percentage. I just think if you're going to introduce guys like Scotty Miller and Ben Skronik, it should be taking away from Van and Calvin Austin, not George Pickens. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Like, if you so want to play I, Van and George Pickens on every snap, okay. Like, I don't think I can make an argument that they aren't their two best receivers. I just think if you're going to put in other guys just for their blocking ability, it should not be taken away from 14. Again, right. unless he was you know, just tired. And then, okay, whatever. Deal with it. Uh, we'll see if the trend continues uh, week three in regards to that. Uh, but I want to come back to Bark Sports Fan here because they had a Bark Sports Fan their... getting like a whole episode deserved to them, by the way, or, or dedicated <laughs> to them. Very, very nice. Uh, they said, how would you evaluate Arthur Smith in game two? Uh, we talked a lot about him in game one, thinking that a lot of the process was there and that the offense did a lot of good things, just didn't show on the scoreboard. How did you feel about the performance in game two? I thought it was interesting because they scored the touchdown in the first half of this game, which they did not do in the first game. And I actually kind of liked their play calling in the first game better than, than uh, yesterday. Um, I thought it was okay. I thought we didn't see as much of Justin Fields being Justin Fields, which is interesting because this was the week that they kind of knew from the beginning that he was going to be the quarterback. Like, honestly, this looked more like it in some ways, a Russell Wilson game plan. Like there was just not as much quarterback run. Um, there wasn't any of the bootleg stuff that we had seen the first week. And so I, I don't know. I think part of that is we talked a little bit after the game about like different ways to combat pass rush. And I just think they were not really afraid of Denver's pass rush. Um, but I I don't know. I, I didn't think it was as crisply called of a game as the first one was i'm not really going to blame arthur smith for what happened in the second half i thought the team made a strategic decision to get conservative just that they just they had 13 and they did not think that the broncos were going to score 14 under any circumstances and so i think they made a, a strategic decision to take their foot off the gas and then i don't think fields executed that well in that second half um but I didn't think that it was the play calling's fault. You know, when you're deciding that you're going to be conservative, they still ran the ball fine. Um, it was mostly the penalties and then Fields not being able to convert on like third and medium. I'm glad you mentioned the running stuff because that was honestly the first thing that I thought QB run stuff. Uh, that was honestly the first thing that I thought of. I hadn't even, you know, really thought about the fact that this was a, a longer week than they had in the first week to really know that Justin was going to be the guy that they were game planning here for. Um, but that is honestly where my mind went to. That was really the only thing. Cause a lot of people are like, you know, wanting to see more deep shots or whatever. I thought he threw the ball deep, but like, you know, if you take those penalties out of it, I thought he took an, an adequate amount of deep shots in this game, Especially like, I don't considering think of... number two is out there, and you probably yeah. are 
are pressing your luck every time you test him. Um, yeah, absolutely. And like they ran the ball, even though they got conservative uh, in the second half, you look at the, like 26 carries for what is it, 111 yards between Harris and Warren. Like that's, there's nothing wrong mm-hmm. with that. You know, like that's, yeah. that's four yards a gets over four yards a carry. Yeah. So they were still able to run the ball, even though they made the strategic decision to get conservative. They just made mistakes, got behind the sticks, and then couldn't execute. Um, I want to kind of tie this comment in because it still involves Arthur Smith. By the way, I love this name too. You brought it up to me when we were talking about you know who whose questions and comments to get to. I comment for algorithm. So I don't know if this person literally created this just to be able to help us out with our algorithm, but we appreciate that uh, if that was the case and you should do the same. Uh, hey, Alan, how much of the playbook and potential creativity do you think we have yet to see? It seems to be to me like Arthur Smith and Mike Tomlin have been content to let the defense win the game and avoid turnovers, so they haven't really had to pull from the real depth of the playbook yet. Uh, they said, hey, Alan, so you know, I'm not even going to chime in on this one. <laughs> just the implied F you, Zach. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what they signed off with. Uh, I think, well, to be fair, this was a comment on morning rush. So, uh, oh, all right. Yeah. All right. That's fair. Sorry. Uh, I yeah. comment for algorithm. I guess, right. I guess, I guess that's fair. Um, I think the, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, they very clearly thought that they had gotten to a number on offense that was going to win them the game these last two weeks and that they did not need to do a lot more than that. And so there was no reason to introduce any additional risk. I talked a lot about this this morning and like there will be times when they're going to have to do that. I think there's a lot of this offense that we haven't really seen. Um, Justin sort of said they put in a lot of no huddle for this week and they used it for one drive, maybe two drives. Um, Hmm. And so like, I think that's a a really like if they're putting a lot of no huddle and then then the whole second half, they're just like, nah, that's the opposite of what we want to do right now. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any like there's no lack of creativity in Arthur Smith. Like that the man is honestly too cute sometimes. Um the the idea that this offense as like it, or, or is going to be boring from a play caller standpoint, I like I think the people that are saying like this looks just like last year's offense, like they're, they're way off base. I think this offense is dramatically improved in terms that of is... its X's and O's uh, capabilities. Like there's, there's like a third and five out route to George Pickens where he's open by nine yards and like they get the first down easily. And you're just like, wow, they didn't do anything like that last year. <laughs> like, like yeah, mm-hmm. there's, there's so much stuff out there that is so much better than what they had last year in terms of passing concepts. The running concepts are pretty vanilla. Like, we haven't seen hardly any of the power stuff that they kept from Canada sprinkled in yet. It's been all zone. And I, I guess the idea there is to keep running it until they somebody finally really stops them. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see any lack of creativity in Arthur Smith at all. I think people are attributing that those words lack of creativity to the results that they've gotten so far on offense they haven't scored a lot of points so it's not creative i think that's honestly where a lot of it comes from and also the fact that a lot of it isn't being uh executed by the football players right now as well yeah i mean at some point you're going to need to score more than this and at some point you're going to have to show some more but i yeah i don't think that we've even really scratched the surface of what arthur smith is willing to call and has in his his little uh war chest there i got there, there's a there's a lot more and and i think they're being I, I think they're being overly careful with justin fields they are they are calling a game as if they do not trust him to not turn the ball over and so you can only do so much when this is the back, so, like so, so. I wrote on Twitter today uh, that, like, hey, the Steelers are two and zero. They played you know, with their backup quarterback and the, all these. And someone mm-hmm. said, 
it's not really fair to call Justin Fields the backup. It's like they're treating him like the backup. So I'm going to call him the backup. He's getting the the uh, Charlie Batch game plan, the Mike Tomzak game plan, if you're of my era, right? The like, just yeah. go out there and don't screw it up and the rest of us will win it for you. That's what mm-hmm. they're giving Justin Fields. So yeah, they're, they're not showing anywhere near the full offense here. They're literally just saying, please don't lose it for us. Here's the things we think you can do within that that paradigm. Last thing before we got out of here, because this just popped in my mind as you were talking there. Does that make you, and I don't know where you know you stood on this in terms of was it realistic for, we, we both assume that Justin's going to start this game, next game, right, against the Chargers? I, I think Russ not having done any teamwork to this point makes me rather skeptical. And I think Fields has been, good enough that there's no reason to put a less than 100% Russell Wilson out there. So I agree. I think Justin Fields is going to play. So that, okay. So then that my neck, my part of that was assuming that you were on the same page there was it's kind of been put out there like that, that was going to be the case. And depending on how he looked, Justin could win the job. But if you are kind of going into this with the game plans that you're saying there, and you're not really giving him that opportunity, like, do you feel that, that, that that's actually on the table? for him to win that job if, like if you're like those two things don't really marry for me like how can you say that he's being given the opportunity to really win the job if you're not if you're p- putting these handcuffs on him kind of protecting him from that i'm not sure that he is being given an opportunity to win the job i think okay. he would have had to blow some people away um like before we know. even got to the regular season no i think he had an opportunity to win the job before we got to the regular season, certainly. But I think yeah. now... Yeah, but I'm saying, been, so once we got to the regular season... Yeah, like, like I don't, you don't think, think that he's... I mean, if he had gone out there and thrown for, like, four touchdowns and 300 yards, absolutely he'd win the job. Um, I just don't think we've seen enough... Like, the, the way out of the backup quarterback box is for the team to execute well enough to give you confidence to let you do more. And even though they're winning, like, they're not... They're not doing that well, right? And so mm-hmm. I just, when you get through a half where you were okay, but you shot yourself in the foot a whole bunch and you're up two scores on a pretty bad team, you're not like, hey, that's shooting ourselves in the foot a whole bunch. Let's go try more of that. Like, no, no it's just like, <laughs> let's just get through this thing with a W and figure it out next week. When, yeah. when your mindset from the coaching staff is let's just get through it and figure it out next week, that does not, that does not tell me they're, particularly thrilled with the play of their quarterback yeah no or anybody, I mean, I, I'm, that matter. I'm in the same boat i was just curious as to where you stood on the notion that that's still in play for him to do i mean again uh, if he goes know. out there and they execute and they like I mean, just think about how different that game could have been if they go down the field and score you know a couple more times in that first half and they get it like a laugher and then you're not like tight right then it's like oh well we're up three touchdowns oh well, we can just run the offense and see what happens you know, mm-hmm. like I just, I they should have won that game by a lot more than they did, and I think mm-hmm. the lack of execution of the offense as a whole is the major reason they did not. And yeah. fair or not fair, the quarterback's going to wear an outsized portion of that. I don't think it was all his fault. I think the penalties were a big sure. part of it. And last time I checked, he didn't take any of them. But uh, I, I just think it's really tough for me to see or to say like, Oh yeah, Justin Fields is winning this job. Like he had 117 yards passing. That's not getting it done. I don't care what else happened or why it happened. Right. Absolutely. Let us know your thoughts on that particular thing. Anything that we talked about today, of course, in the comments or if question for future episodes, as you can see, we love getting to your guys' questions and comments uh, at some point throughout the episodes. Alan, tell the people they can find you at a Saunders underscore PGH PGH Steelers. Now Steelers now.com. Like and subscribe to YouTube channel. Hit that bell for notifications. Don't miss an episode of Afternoon Drive, Morning Rush, Sights and Sounds, any of the other stuff we got going on. At some point this week, I'm going to talk about why you are all wrong about how much TJ Watt is held. Maybe that will be tomorrow. <laughs> I'm just going to keep teasing it until I get there because I've been told that's good radio. So, yeah. There you go. Absolutely. Uh, if you are listening somewhere else, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast from, be sure to leave us a five-star review and subscribe over there and hit us up on TikTok as well, Steelers Afternoon Drive. You can find me everywhere, Zachary Smith, PGH. Fallon Saunders and myself, thanks for jumping in. Take another ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive. Mm-hmm.